Have you ever had to start from zero or felt like an imposter? Or have you realized that asking for help is not such a terrible thing after all? My guest experienced all this and more. Originally from India, she now calls Hong Kong her home. This former banker turned entrepreneur and coach focuses on helping corporate leaders navigate transitions in their work and she has been in this business since 2012. Hello and welcome to Season 4 of the Women Premier Asia Podcast and I'm your host, Krista Good. I'm also an entrepreneur, author, marketeer, storyteller and connector. Each season, I curate stories and journeys of Asian women entrepreneurs from India to Japan who are open enough to talk about their businesses. These are real conversations with everyday women in business across Asia. This episode is brought to you by my company, Redbox Studio. Today's episode is with Lalita Raman, who is the CEO of Transitions International Limited based out of Hong Kong, where she facilitates and coaches in the areas of leadership and communications. In short, her role is to help senior leaders and executives find clarity, confidence and conviction to manage workplace changes and perform to their best potential. We had a brilliant conversation about overcoming the imposter syndrome, asking for help, starting from ground zero and becoming an entrepreneur after years as a corporate person and the struggles that come along with being a long-time corporate person too. Let's get started. Lalita, welcome to Womenpreneur Asia. Hello, Krista. How are you doing? Good. And Lalita, where are you today? I am in Hong Kong and I've been here for the past 27 years and I haven't travelled anywhere for the past two, two and a bit years. <laughs> That's a great way to introduce yourself. <laughs> but we know that you're not from Hong Kong, right? Where are you from, Lalita? Uh, I am from India. I'm an Indian and I'm from India and... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> now that you ask, I came here, work brought me, I used to be a banker and um, work brought me here 27 years back. Uh, it was a two year assignment and the two got stretched to four and the rest is history. And for the past decade or so, I'm in a completely different field also. So there you go. This is home for me. Hong Kong is home. I mean, I still have my roots in India, but Hong Kong for 27 long years has been my home. So, and specifically, which part of India are you from? I'm from Bombay, uh, or Mumbai, as she is called now, or for the past so many years. I still prefer calling Bombay rather than Mumbai. But yes, I'm from Mumbai. That's where I, I was brought up. That's where my sister lives, uh, my in-laws live. And unfortunately, my parents are no more. I know you mentioned that you're a banker when you first came to Hong Kong. Could yeah. you... Tell how you ended up in Hong Kong, but you're now no longer a bank. This was ages back. Um, but, you know, in the days when uh, I, I, I finished my graduation and I did my uh, CPA, the in thing those days, not only in India, but probably all over the world, uh, was to be a banker. Investment banking, and in, in in India those days it was called foreign banks. Uh, no longer, but those days it was called foreign banks. So I I had this, and I got calls from from uh, so, uh, companies, uh, uh, manufacturing FMCGs, banks, etc. And I jumped at the opportunity when I was called for a bank interview, and I got through, and that's how I landed up in bank. Now about a year and a half. Uh, I used to be with City, and about a year and a half into my job, I was asked whether I would be interested in an opportunity in Singapore. And I said, of course. Now, at the same time, my husband now, um, he was uh, also uh, being offered by his company for an opportunity in China. And I was very clear in my mind that family is important, relationship is important. And I'm not sacrificing my career for that. As in, I won't leave everything and just move to a place, right? So he went ahead because his was much more quicker. And then I went to went to my, my bank and said, hey, you know, uh, Singapore is a bit uh, difficult now. I, I'll take it up. Could you consider moving me to Hong Kong instead of Singapore? And it all worked out. And that's how I landed up in 1995. Seems years, 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 years back, 27 years back. 
um, exactly in January uh, in Hong Kong. And, you know, for me, it was a, it, it was the first time that I was getting out of my home. I had never lived in a boarding school. I had not lived in any, um, I never lived away from my parents. I had always grown up with my parents. And for me, this was the first time I was actually stepping foot outside the house. So it did feel a bit, I was excited at the same time, probably uh, a bit ambivalent in terms of, ooh, I, can I do this? I'm, I'm, I mean, you know, and I'm going to be living on my own in a country I don't know anything. And that's how the journey began. And I moved to various banks. And, you know, in my banking career, I moved a lot of roles in, in the 20 years that I was with banks. Um, and for almost 10 to maybe 12 years, uh, a good part of my banking career, I was in um, sales, uh, equity sales, equity hedge fund sales, equity um, derivative sales. And I enjoyed doing that. And for me, every step of the way was the first 10 year, eight or 10 years was really a steep um, climb for me in terms of getting out of my comfort zone. Uh, because I was very fearful of the trading floor. Uh, I, I still consider me to be a shy person, but much more, much more um, outspoken than what I was if you had met me you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 years back. And so for me, it was all about exploration of, oh my God, I'm, I'm scared to do this. Why don't I go ahead and do it? And I never realized it when I was doing it. It just was one step, next step, next step, next step. And so the question comes, what, what uh, made me move from banking to what I do now, which is, you know, uh, executive coach, facilitation, uh, helping people in their, in their transitions journey, helping leaders. I think the, the, it was three main reasons. One was, you know, being a banker, I had in my, as a person, I had taken on challenges, a lot of challenges, right? Um, and I had overcome those challenges. And again, being a banker, you know, the banking world is such that there are a lot of challenges that come your way. Um, and I was put on the deep end in terms of the roles I took up, in the terms of the, uh, so the the market condition, the dynamics, you know, some of them being 2008, 2003 in Hong Kong. Uh, they were not one of the best times, uh, you know, in terms of stability and security. And for me, all of those was difficult, challenging and yet a learning experience. And I realized that and many times I was the only woman and the only Indian in many of the departments that I was in. And as much as, you know, it was jumping from one to the other, I got to do, I've achieved this, I've got to do next. And I probably never celebrated all that as much as I should have. Uh, and I'm sure you wear a smile, I'm sure you can relate to that. Um, it was about what, I think it, this, this kind of um, uh, aha moment or something that I started questioning was possibly during the 2008 financial crisis. I, I felt like doing something different. I didn't know what it was. And I think the need of that basically After came so from, long in banking. Yes, after <laughs> so long in banking, exactly. Right? So, and I think it was led by three things. Uh, or my transitions into what I do now was led by three things. One, um, I realized that I'm someone who uh, is very led by, if I'm driven by something, I take that as what drives me day to day. Even if I have to overcome a lot of uh, hurdles, challenges on the way, I'm so much driven by that end thing that I'm able to get over a lot of the hurdles and challenges on the way. And I realized, you know, probably the mind, and that's how I've been brought up as well. And the second reason, um, so I was diagnosed as a juvenile diabetic type 1 uh, when I was 8 years old. And I think that, that, and the way I was brought up, and the way, you know, my parents brought me up, my doctors treated me, was always to not, not have an attitude of, oh my God, this is horrible or this sucks and all of that, right? But essentially to take up an attitude that we don't, life throws many times a curveball at us. And the only thing we have control of is our attitude. 
And I think that has led me throughout my life. And my parents have not told me, but they led by example. And for me, that was the biggest inspiration all through my life, even today, though they are no more. And I think I I realized that much later in life that that's what has driven me quite a lot. And I said, I must somehow, and somewhere I, I, I always, even within the banking world, I love to inspire people, motivate people, uh, you know, help them figure out what their strengths are. I didn't do enough of it, but in team management, etc., that is what for me was the most important. So, and the third reason being, you know, since I'm a diabetic, I, I actually wanted to become a doctor. And I didn't, um, because at that stage, you know, my doctor at that at that stage, as well as my my parents, uh, basically said, you know, you can try. And we would really not, we, we would want you to consider something else, because if you get rejected on medical grounds, which is a high possibility, it's it may not be right, but that's what the system is. It may end up treating you like that. We don't want you to start something with disappointment, anger, frustration, uh, and all of that. We we know you're capable. We know you're capable of maybe even fighting the system. But that takes a toll on, on, it could take a toll on you. And we don't want you to start your life like that. So I took their advice, didn't become a doctor. And for me, this was kind of filling that gap. Uh, how so? It was filling the gap because... In terms of what I do, right, help people find their potential, uh, you know, help leaders, empower leaders to uh, go through their formal transitions, you know, when they move jobs and they are promoted uh, or even informal transitions such as the ones we've gone through the pandemic, right? Um, how can I ma- manage my team better? How can I communicate better? What is What has worked till now may not work. So how can I flex my style and all of that? All of that adds to a lot of stress, anxiety, overwhelm. And if we don't manage it well, and if we don't believe in ourselves because of all of those expectations of ourselves and someone else, that anxiety can cause health issues. So I said, if I'm able to help people find their potential and live up to their potential, right, and empower them to to be really shine that and amplify that, then they wouldn't have to necessarily be going to the doctor as much. So that was a link to me for terms of okay. I so in the end, doctor. in the end, if I may surmise, yes. is that eventually you're also in a way uh, doing some form of healthcare. I would think so. <laughs> yes, I would love to believe that. Yes, yes. Even though you didn't uh, get to be a doctor, but you kind of, yeah. in a way. You know, in, in a, in a way, little yes. roundabout way, you know, yes, you are you are preventing yeah. people from getting to that part of their lives so they don't want to be in. Exactly, exactly, yeah. right? Because yeah. very well summarized, and you know, because conversation, the inner, inner, our fear, our inner talk, uh, you know, not believing in ourselves, a lot of that, especially in an environment like this, and we all live in huge uncertainty, can definitely cause a lot of. Um, anxiety and you know stress and some stress is good but if the stress becomes overly uh, exaggerated it has very bad implications on health so yes in a way yeah I help people and how, and, and how, has, and how has living in Hong Kong uh, been for you because I know of course you, right now you're doing a lot of uh, coaching and a lot of training on communication leadership and all that but how has living in Hong Kong for the last 27 years also, um, well, in a way, influenced you in what you do? Oh, big time. Um, so when I came to Hong Kong, for me, it was I had no idea about the city. I had not done any homework, nothing. I just landed up here. Very unlike me. But the, there are two parts in my life that coming to Hong Kong without any exploration and as well as the transitions from investment banking to what I did now. Didn't explore just said, I'm I'm going to follow what is my passion. Let's see what lands up. So those are two places. So I think Hong Kong for me has been a place where I have developed myself, I've grown. And the freedom and the, you know, the cultural exposure as well as the 
exposure, to, in, especially from, the, from a financial markets point of view, phenomenal. I don't think I could have got it in any other city. Um, and the, the beauty about Hong Kong, which I even love today, is, you know, I'm, I'm a fitness freak. And in 15, 20 minutes, and I love being up close and personal with nature, you can go on a lovely hike and come back. You know, there's so much of concrete, yet in 15, 20, 25 minutes, you can be with nature. Beautiful, you can climb beautiful mountains, there's a lot of greenery. So to, you know, to to sum up Hong Kong, it's she's been, she's been a, a great journey in terms of exploration, in terms of the wonderful people I've met, the wonderful opportunities, efficient, uh, and there's been it's been hassle free where you're welcomed yeah a lot of people say hong kong can be overwhelming yes it can um and yet when you find your grounding it's a great place to be let's talk about your business yes. um who do you serve in your business so um my cl- potential clients or the clients that i've served can be anyone um now that's does that mean the whole world? No, uh, not the whole world. But someone who, you know, typically in um, in organizations, right? When I when I move from one role to another role, or I get promoted, uh, and I'm managing a bigger team, uh, maybe from five people to thirty people, there are some. It's not that I'm. I have been promoted because I've been good at what I do. And yet, when there is there is a shift in the role, there are there are there are challenges which could arise in terms of my own expectations, other people's expectations, and a lot of times during transitions, the you still associate yourself with your old role, your old identity, and it takes a while for us to shift that identity from from that old to the new. And a shift is required, sometimes more, sometimes even small, right? So therefore, I am the sounding board, I'm the thinking partner for for leaders who undergo transitions, um, lateral transitions, vertical transitions, informal transitions, to empower them in, in the ways they communicate with their team, in the ways they communicate maybe in front of the board of directors, in the way they... Um, enhance their executive presence because some of the situations they may be may be uncomfortable uh, not that they don't know how to do it it just feels uncomfortable in the gut and that all of those challenges many times prevents leaders to be who they would want to be because each of us want to shine and do well in our job so that's what I enable people to do. Uh, so my clients could be basically anyone in transition. When you talk about transitions and the uh, people that you've worked with in senior leadership positions, what do you see as some of the like most pressing issues that they should address? I, I know what you mean when you say when they're promoted and they get to the next level. But yes, I do understand that some people just are still stuck in that old <laughs> position or old minds. What are some of the, the issues or underlying challenges? So one, you know, and this is coming from my own experience of transitions, right? Um, so I changed from investment banking to a completely different field. Transitions can be as drastic as that. It can be as small as I'm managing five people. Not small, but it can be a smaller change which you know i'm moving managing five people to 30 people and running a business now right or heading up a business and one of the common as human beings when we take up any role we have our own expectation that we need to do well we want to do well and yet when you are moving into a new role we are not all in the know we will never be all in the know Yet unconsciously, that's what is happening. We believe we have to know everything. It's more of a have to, right? And within organizations, that also comes about from people around me. Maybe my boss, maybe my senior management, maybe uh, uh, the, the team who's going to report into me, or this person internally or externally, 
the the intensity could differ but internally or externally oh this person is is being promoted or this person has been hired to take up this role he or she better know everything and that whole that i need to know everything can be quite overwhelming in a way that i feel i need to know everything and i get into that vicious circle of oh my god if i don't know anything how do i ask and we get so stuck in that mindset that it stops us from performing the way we want to perform and that's one of the biggest and common challenges last year i concluded a a, a coaching of one of the leaders who uh, was was promoted to the regional head and the first thing he said to me was lalita you know i am not in the habit of asking help and i've realized that i'm quite lonely because um i don't know even if i want to in those one odd occasions i don't know whom to ask for help it feels embarrassing because i don't want people to see me as i don't know and that can lead to the way we come if i you see the thing is and you'll see a lot of research on this when we believe that we can't and we don't know but we need to show as if we know it creates a lot of pressure and that affects in the way i communicate with you it affects my executive presence my leadership presence in the way i come across to you in terms of my behaviors and when the pressure increases it leads to irritation it it leads to some of the some of the consequences right it leads to irritation it leads to people uh, perceiving me as arrogant because i'm trying to avoid meeting people right it also leads to um being very snappy in the way i communicate my my uh, also i'm not a, i'm not listening in, in in the way i need to listen so different aspects of who i am as a human being and therefore as a leader gets affected and that in turn leads to obviously pressure on performance and the negative consequences from not being able to perform the way i expect myself to perform and others expect me to perform most common challenge so inherent in all this is that we expect leaders to know everything bingo and have the right answers and be you know there to answer every single question that anyone has yeah so stressed <laughs> Exactly and I know I had that my when I moved and I changed roles right I was like um I managed teams I uh, you know and I I mean I certified myself and I started pro bono and all of that and I know I was under a lot of pressure I put a lot of pressure on myself I need to perform really at my very very best and and get like 30 clients 40 clients in within a year I had put so much pressure on myself and now when I reflect and think back as they say hindsight is the best sight I realized that I was putting so much pressure that I was not possibly allowing myself to perform the way I wanted to perform and there is a lot of research and evidence which is given by neuroscience and you know uh, psychoanalysis psychodynamics that how that actually affects in the way you your the way you come across to people in the way you consider yourself in the way you hold yourself and that's why you know you see anxiety overwhelm um and a lot of the consequences from that into mental health problems etc again now added to that also the the whole pandemic pandemic scenario yeah. right yeah and of course now the pandemic has created another type of stress the stress of uh working from home or not yeah. right yes. and then if we do yes. work from home that also has its own pressures mm-hmm. because you're in a space where you're with other people family mm-hmm. so yeah that creates another kind of stress so what you, you mentioned just now was uh, a really good way for me to also want to delve into when you first started your business what were the early years like oh uh a roller coaster absolute roller coaster so 
not having done any research, just having so I quit and I said, okay, I need to grow this 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 what I put into the back burner. I need to grow and see what that leads me into. Okay, inspiring people, workshops, leadership, all of those are topics that interest me. And that's how I chanced upon coaching. Till then for me coaching was sports coaching. I really didn't know what organizational coaching, transformational coaching, transitions coaching, none of that was, right? And when I chanced upon coaching, I came across coaching based on neuroscience. And I was like, oh, this sounds interesting. And that's how I got trained myself coaching based on neuroscience and I explored which one is a better. So there are various coaching certifications etc and I did under the ICF because I realized I didn't begin with the ICF I began with another organization called ICC. But then I realized that ICF is much more globally accepted than ICC. So the whole process you know for me I think the first one year was a learning journey. I had to set up my own website. I didn't know ABC, but I learned it all on my own and did it. Um could I have hired somebody? Yes. I was I didn't want to do that because I was like I don't have that much of uh I mean I had my savings, but I obviously I had like x number of months of from my company because I had uh, you know uh, gotten a package. But I didn't want to really erode on that that fast. by hiring left right and center people and i was also i invest a lot of money in my own personal development and growth and i had registered for a lot of courses this that and i'm not using the word spend i'm using the word invest because it's for my own growth and development i underestimated this i thought oh my contacts in investment banking will help me get me uh, you know to to get the business on pro bono and then i can establish my credibility and surely move to pay and that's where i was wrong because people saw me only as the people who knew me saw me as an investment banker coach who said and you know my own the way i explain it today and the way i used to explain it those days completely different and that's where i i that's something which i mentioned earlier uh, in our conversation as well was unless and until you're convinced and until and unless you know that you can you know internalize it the expression and the communication is not that is not that is not the way you want it to be and that's what happened to me as well right i was still attached to my whole identity you were still a banker <laughs> in my mind i was still a banker right i thought the switch could be just like that unfortunately not i mean i knew it was not but i don't think i had internalized it as much So the way I used to introduce myself is hi I'm Lalita I'm an ex investment banker. And this went on for 3 years. I had not gotten out of that identity. Because for me I felt that gave me credibility. I'm a no one here. So I want to I want to let people know that I do have experience. I'm not just someone who is just cropped out of the blue and saying I can help you. I do have credibility. and then i realized i need to reframe the way i come across to people right because yes i'm an investment banker but what is that led me what's the connection between what i did and what i want to do now so slowly i had to change that and it's been i have i enjoyed every moment of it no because you know uncertainty that feeling of um, i'm someone who is who who has high expectations of myself and were all of those expectations met no uh and therefore uh you know dealing with disappointments dealing with frustration dealing with am i good enough uh dealing with imposter syndrome uh all of that i had to manage i also had a coach and for me it was i think the biggest transition was getting rid of the old identity So there is the when you transition there's the ending of the old thing the middle phase which is where all the messiness happens and then the new beginning but the new beginning doesn't just happen with a click of a thumb it doesn't right it takes a while and i don't think we we give ourselves the chance me included 
so when i if at all i transition into something else i would definitely do that in a much more different way if i did it another time and what would it, the way be now now that i think as as <laughs> you have seen that transition the messy the yes. messy the uncomfortable and yes. if right now i were ask lalita if you could yes. do it again yes what would you do differently what i would do differently is one i would explore beforehand i would not just do it spontaneously then i'll maintain a little bit of spontaneity because that's where the fun is that's where the challenge is and i love that uh so i would explore i would research a lot more i would speak to a lot more people um i would also really enlist my strengths what am i good at what have i done well especially challenges that i've overcome how did i do it what did i develop how have i become the person i am today because of what and i would explore all of that and use those i mean i've used it but not in my first 3 years when i when i started doing this right the first 3 4 years which is when you need that that strong belief in yourself and the foundation and i would also um i'm a lot more outspoken now i mean i was i mean i'm so it's been an evolving lalita right it's somebody so this is someone who has i'm so i approached you right on linkedin i just sent you a message and that's how i approached you did i do that when i started this a decade back no i was i was very hesitant to do it these days i'm much more open about doing it so th- these are the things i will do differently and i'm sure i'll make another transition i don't know to what uh because i'm someone who loves to explore so i'll keep that going and i'll i'll um uh, not not put myself under that much pressure of having way too high expectations of myself and work with the system much more why do you think and this is not just uh addressed to you why do you think people are hesitant to reach out to others and i know you reached out to me on linkedin which i deeply yeah. appreciate because that's how the both of us are recording and having this conversation today but what do you think makes people just you know not interested in reaching out to others it's from my own experiences um of reaching out uh or when pe- some people have reached out to me and i haven't really replied back i have replied but i have not followed through so i'm going to mix my response is going to be based on both of these right i think one i don't think it's necessarily to do with disinterest i'll take disinterest as the last one i think is a fear uh if i ask someone the fear of rejection the fear of getting no response because continuously when you don't get responses no matter how strong you are it impacts who you are especially the you know in the past what about 3 4 years i mean even linkedin has changed it's all about oh how many likes did i get oh how many views did i get i mean that's what we are all driven by So in a world even if you want to cut off yourself from all of that noise and have a strong grounding there are moments when you get affected especially when you have not had a good day so i think that's the first reason the fear of rejection the fear of not being liked or maybe i'm not good enough and it's all perceived it's not real but that creates that impact secondly i think um it's about the So I've had a, three people who reached out to me right I've had a very bad experience Str- complete strangers and I looked up their profile and I sort of accepted the request and had a conversation etc and it turned into a nightmare a nightmare in terms of them chasing me down with emails and you know asking this and that and and I was like I'm just trying to help this person out and they it almost felt they're putting me down and it it just it just didn't feel good So I think that's the second the fear of that right that I don't know this person well enough are they going to take advantage of me that are they going to harass me are they going to harass me exactly <laughs> so that I mean even though linkedin is much better than facebook and what have you it has an element of that still yes and the third comes from 
um and i think it's a combination of disinterested i don't have the time um and i you know the feeling of i couldn't be bothered you know i i i don't have time for all of this so i couldn't be bothered it's a combination of all of those three where i mean i you know i've approached so many people and i've not got responses and i typically the way i approach people is i see what are some of the common links where i can you know at least start a conversation would that land into me asking for business i'm not very good at that maybe i should i should do that more but you know for me it's about i love having conversations i love it and it's about a relationship and yeah maybe we could do something together maybe not but what's the harm in exploring getting to know each other not probing into personal lives and i think that's another fear right maybe they'll probe into my personal lives i don't want to be as vulnerable with everyone i may be vulnerable to you but may not be to someone else so all of that i think is what most people probably just don't bother looking or um uh, accepting stranger requests yeah for, for me i personally understand uh this fear of rejection is probably mm. top of everyone's mind mm. and per- i can tell people i mean sometimes i reach out to someone online doesn't have to be linked to be any other platform and nothing right the person doesn't reply or there could be some really overzealous people who want to <laughs> connect and then after that they keep spamming you with hey look at my brochure look at my stuff so yeah i i understand that fear of connecting with total strangers on a mm. virtual platform that we don't know anything about except what we read on their profile right yeah exactly so, exactly so i understand but once in a while you do end up meeting fabulous people like that's how we relate to each other <laughs> so, absolutely so we need and to you take it with you know like yes. really like understand that there are sometimes we really do hit uh, the goal mine indeed just like you and i right yeah So in fact, anyone, now that you mentioned this, right? Yeah. Uh, I would like to add something. Um a very very pleasant experience that I that I've had and I wrote a post about it on LinkedIn the other day. Is this was 2015? Uh yeah, that's when we published. So 16 of us including myself. To date, I have not met any of them. I've met them only on Skype or, or Zoom on or those days Zoom was not used much it was more Skype or Google Meet or whatever. We had you know so we used to and I used to be very active on Twitter so you know used we used to retweet each other's blog posts comment on each other's blog posts through Twitter. And some more connection and there used to be I may it may be even now but I don't participate. There used to be a lot of these Twitter chats on different topics, right? Time management, people skills, leadership, lead from within, etc., etc., right? And it used to be for one hour, uh, organized by different people. And some of us, people who had written these books, sixteen uh, of us who wrote this book, had formed connections through this more. And can you believe it? We got together, collaborated, co-created, got out of our comfort zone, and written and published a book together. and i have and i and many others in that group haven't even met anyone face to face brilliant relationship and we still often on keep in touch on email or linkedin we like each other's posts we still do that so there is a connection it's a and it's a great connection yeah and and these days i think a lot more collaborations are happening that way because of what's happened in the last 2 years because of the pandemic we are just forced to try out new things because in yes. the past probably the person would think twice like why why wouldn't uh, we meet first and start mm. some conversations offline before we actually yes. got together to write a book or to do a project yes. but these yes. days i i'm hearing so many stories of people just getting together online because we feel that if you have a connection you feel that you know you're aligned in values Yeah. You want to do something together, and yes. and to me that yes. is the beauty of digital, right? It's like absolutely you can do anything with anyone as long as you like that person, know, like, and trust that person. Indeed, I think it's more the trust, right? Because I don't think any of us want to be, no matter our personality, our style, whatever, right? None of us want to be put down. None of us want to 
uh, really live with an experience where somebody hurts us and thus uh, breaks our trust. And I think trust is like is important. I think trust is a lot more important. Yeah. And, and to me, I think, you know, in the past, I always felt that, yes, if you ask someone and the person doesn't respond, there's something wrong with us or there's something wrong, you know, how we approach that person. But right. these days, I think maybe it's age, right? <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I just say, to hell with it. You know, if I tried and I did my best and I tried yes. to reach out to the person, connect with the person, the person doesn't respond. That person may be having a bad day. Not me. Yeah. It's not me, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think we, we should take rejection with a pinch of salt. We should not even, you know, overrate it. Of course, people reject us. I mean, I've been rejected many times. Yeah. But and it's interesting you use. I mean, I know I use the word, and it it may not even be rejection. Why frame in our own mind as rejection, right? Yeah. Maybe they just they just didn't seem very interested, or maybe they don't have the time, or maybe they've had a bad day, or maybe they haven't even looked at the message because they're overwhelmed with so many messages. It could all be all of that, and rejection doesn't need to be part of it because. When we use the word rejection, the way it reacts on our brain is very different. Yeah. So, yeah. That, I know I use the word and I think... We should find I a better word. Re- <laughs> exactly. It's, when, they, when, a, when a request from you is not uh, met with a response that you expect, it's okay, move on, right? So, now that you've been in business for this many years, right? Mm-hmm. What have you learned about yourself? That if I set my mind to something, I can achieve it. And when I doubt myself, that's when things get a bit uncomfortable, a bit challenging. And when I doubt myself, that's when I, I'm my worst enemy. It's important to believe in myself. I agreed. I may not be able to do everything because we are all not, we don't have skills in every set, right? And and as much as you need a growth mindset, it doesn't mean you go and do things which you know you're not skilled at. That's not what growth mindset is about. Using that growth mindset just to figure out, hey, what have I done well? And how can I make myself believe in myself? And not allow this, the, the, the challenges, the hurdles to... to overwhelm me use that I mean I, I said I'm curious I'm a, I love exploration how can I use my curious and exploratory mind and manage my expectation versus reality that's that's an ever learning process because expectations are there as a human being and reality and how can I get a balance between the two it's still an evolving process for me because there are some things which I said, it's okay, no big deal. So that's that's something which I have learned. There are some other things which I'm a lot more um, passionate about, a lot more wanting uh, uh, that, uh, like, you know, if you apply for a job, you desperately want that job because you just love the, the profiling and everything. There are some some projects which I would love to work on and when I when I bid for that and I don't get it then the disappointment is higher and what I've learned is I don't need to judge myself and I don't need to criticize myself based on those results I can always ask what can I do different and finally it's about really a journey of finding support for yourself I mean, communities, tribe, one-on-one connections, as well as, you know, being part of a community, being part of a tribe. And those are all things which are way beyond my comfort zone. It used to be, um, because I've taken those steps. And I think those have been the three key learnings for me. And what do you think women don't do enough of? Believe in ourselves. And I think the there are several reasons for that, right? It could be upbringing, um, culture. The, the, the it's not entire. We can't blame ourselves entirely. It's also the systemic. What, what what kind of a system are we living in, 
right? And how much do we believe in ourselves to keep going at it no matter what happens? Of course, cut your losses at the appropriate time. Yet I think the believing in ourselves and empowering ourselves with that mindset, I think is where we can all do better as women. How can we empower ourselves more? <laughs> you know, two, two simple ways. One is, and I don't think we do this enough and it's not meant to be, I mean, I come from a, an upbringing of, you know, humility, be humble, don't be arrogant. We all can still be humble and still figure out what am I good at? What are my strengths? How can I amplify it? What can I add on in a situation like this? How can I use, where, where do I lack? How can I develop that? And really make the way we communicate with ourselves in a much more empowering way, because we don't want to be our worst enemies. We want to be our best friends. And I think that's the first key step. Second, asking for support. Asking for support doesn't mean I'm a bad person, I'm useless, I'm not skilled, none of that. And framing, how would you want to ask for that help, the support? Uh, so if I'm looking for a job, for example, right, I can't come and tell you, hey, Krista, I need a job. I need to be able to frame it in a way where I create that credibility, I create that connection and see how I can then ask for your help. As an example, how that you we've gone or we talked about Lalita, you know, Mumbai and Hong Kong and banking, ex investment banker, yes. <laughs> and starting businesses <laughs> and what you've learned. Yes. What was Lalita like as a young girl? As a child and continuing on and continues on me today is the persistence, the tenacity, uh, that drive to do something. I uh, have always been like that. As a young uh, little girl, Lalita, someone who was shy, someone who was... Um, I still consider myself shy, though many people who know me may say, I don't think you're shy. Perspectives. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, somebody who was shy, somebody who loved uh, reading, somebody who... I still love reading. I used to sort of get involved in the books and the studies and all of that. That's, that's what um, gave me the energy. Um, yeah, somebody who used to... Uh, who used to and still value relationships so I, I don't just like getting into a relationship just to for the sake of it for me a relationship matters it has to grow and you know you, you can do you need to I need to do everything to build and maintain that relationship amplify that relationship and I you know even as a shy person that's what gave me energy um, I never had a whole load of friends you, two friends but those two friends I would do anything for them that's that's been some of the qualities that has been with me as a young Lalita and even as an older Lalita and <laughs> continues on. Um, and I value that. I really treasure those uh, qualities in myself. I think time is the one which creates the maximum pressure, right? The time uh, we expect of ourselves, I, I, I got to get this done in yesterday, right? And the system's the system that we are in as well expects a lot of that, right? You should have done this two days back. <laughs> yeah. And because of the time, the way that the, it puts so much pressure on us that we forget sometimes what are we capable of? What are we good at? And it becomes such a, it's like almost running on a hamster wheel, right? It's just becomes a never ending uh, going on a, on a rudderless journey. Uh, a road to nowhere and that's that we're not doing good justice to ourselves so now we've talked about all the serious stuff let's talk about a little bit lighter stuff so what personal goal are you most focused on at the moment i don't have these new year resolutions or something um but one thing that i would like to get better at uh and really get much more evolving is being someone who 
is able to I, I, I'm doing it much better now and I can still evolve is really trying to be patient with myself uh, not allowing being grounded no matter what I am grounded because of the yoga and uh, you know meditation etc that I do and there are times because I'm I'm a very high energy person and there are times when I want that's why you live in Hong Kong <laughs> that's why you live in Hong Kong there you go and I think that also matters right living in Hong Kong having been an investment banker for 20 years where you have to do that right it's all about quick 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 and I've, I've changed over the 10 years right I've shifted I won't say I've changed but there's been definite shifts there's been definite uh, much more grounding much more calmness and I'm not saying every situation is, is to be calm and uh, you know oh, just, it's not about laid back but really trusting the process being a lot more compassion self-compassionate that's what I want to I want to be more of yeah, self-compassionate Okay. be kind to yourself right <laughs> because you see we if the journey starts with us for hard things and and for ha- challenging things and good things i can't tell you krista you need to be compassionate with 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 x y and z right and listen until i am self i'm compassionate to myself which is self compassion and i think a lot of us don't do that very well You we were harsh on ourselves. Right? Bingo. Bingo. And I that's where we I think we need to give ourselves a break. We got to take a holiday from ourselves. <laughs> Egg. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Right. I mean, you know, how many of us, you know, how many times have you Krista have sort of achieved something and you've said I did well let me just even if it is a celebration doesn't mean you throw a party it can be that but just taking that moment enjoying it really taking in that moment to the fullest I know I'm not done that very well I've I've definitely gotten better at it I I can be quite harsh to myself many times all of us all of us regardless of our gender we are all yeah. hard, hard and harsh because we feel that the next thing is out there the next milestone yes. the next goal right yes. instead of just knowing that this is the goal this is the milestone sometimes yes. and just just be in this very moment to yeah. enjoy that just before we get out the door and do the next thing <laughs> indeed indeed yes so i know you said you like coffee so i don't have to ask yeah. coffee or tea or you mm. like both do you like both I only like coffee. Um the only tea that I have would be a ginger tea or peppermint tea. When I used to be an investment banker there were times when I used to have 10 to 12 lattes with a day. milk a day. So I'm not kidding. So, I'm not <laughs> kidding you. I seriously mean it. and not even small size. Tall or grande, the Starbucks tall or grande. So much so I used to get a free coffee virtually every day from Starbucks because I was such a loyal customer of theirs and they used to get they used to get money for 10 coffees a day right but no nowadays I drink only two uh sometimes three but definitely two I would drink one's in the morning and one's uh, around this time uh, okay so that's how much I love coffee yeah, yeah I moved on you see that's one definitely. thing to drink <laughs> You reduce the number of coffees that you have in a day. This drastically. Good... Drastically, yes. 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 Okay. Favorite book. I and mean, it's been I think 4 or 5 years since I've read fiction books. So I read about of course about coaching, but about life, about um anything that that kind of makes me think differently. and a book which still remains i read this about 5 years back or 4 years back and it still remains um one of my favorites it's not a fun book working identity by herminia ibarra i would really suggest any of us can pick this book and you you it it it's very evolving in the way you think about life 
it's essentially about when you want to make transitions in life right but the way she has written that book the way she has um uh, and i've read it several times extracts of it several times apart from that book uh the other one that i'm very fond of is it's a age old book by uh, dale carnegie uh his his ever famous book was how to win friends and influence people but my favorite book of his is how to get over stress and manage anxiety oh. how to manage stress and anxiety it's a wonderful book it it was written like so many years back right in the 1930s is it relevant today it's as relevant today as it was that day and there's this simple strategy simple tips and they are, they work wonders because i've practiced literally each and every one of them and they work yeah the, this Thank you. this book is a great book um when you get to read it read it and the beauty about this book is you don't need to start and finish it all at once you can read extracts of whatever appeals to you but okay and favorite compliment to others or to myself or That what i receive what you receive to others for me when i compliment someone else it's based on let me give you an example and this is this is real right krista i like the way you approach this you know the way we connected initially and the way we the way we had a conversation you're someone who is diligent genuine and really values relationship thank you so welcome that's the way i like to give appreciation and compliments not just say hey you're great you're fantastic you're awesome and as much as those words are great unfortunately they've lost their meaning because everyone uses it and it sometimes feels it's just people yeah. just saying it without meaning it whereas when you get into more deeper and give based on what like the first time we had a conversation based on that i can say this it, 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 the person knows oh they're taking a real evidence a real experience right and that's that's the way i like to give compliments and appreciate people And how about getting compliments? What's the favorite compliment you've ever received? <laughs> Somebody who said I I'm a visionary. Because I have never thought of myself as a visionary on the day I that that the time I received this was but just when I'd started my current journey, right? Somebody who had said that. And the beauty about receiving or even when you're giving compliments, right? When you're able to when you receive and you're able to give appreciation where somebody doesn't see themselves that in that way but you've given them a reputation to live up to they just grow because they don't want to disappoint what someone else has seen in them and that's why I love that compliment because I had not seen myself like that oh that is powerful I never thought about compliments that way. I thought like okay, compliments were good, especially of course not the trite ones like you're great, you're awesome. I mean those are yeah. really easy to say but really have no meaning to that person receiving them. Mm-hmm. But on the other level when you said what you said just now, I felt that that is true because every time we give a compliment, we could actually be getting that person to think of themselves in another way. that they have never thought of themselves that way ever yes yes so that's yes. a powerful way to actually now start to think when i craft my compliment let me just think of how do i want to challenge this person to get to the next level indeed so there's a lot of things in there right when you're able to give a compliment appreciation to someone you challenge the person you uh enable them to see something that they've not seen in themselves or they haven't visualized themselves like that and therefore it enables them to grow and really not and think of themselves in a in a in a in a way that they also don't want to disappoint what somebody else has seen in them right so in short you're giving them a fine reputation to live up to for themselves and for the world more important for themselves Well said Lalita. Well said. 
<laughs> Thank you. And I learned something today, which I think that's what great conversations are all about. Yes. Learn so much. Uh, we have a lot of insights, and the conversation lives on, even. Mm-hmm. You know, even if we we get offline after this, but it still lives on in our mind because we're processing. We are we can call it percolating. <laughs> we are trying to do something with the information and at the same time trying to make it better. So I had such a wonderful conversation with you, Lalita. I mean, and this is our second time having a conversation, but yes, I think uh, this both times were equally beneficial and fruitful. On, on so many levels So thank, thank you, you For that And thank finally you. Where yes. can people Find you online? People can find me On LinkedIn Just look up Lalita Raman As my name appears here And you'll find me On LinkedIn I don't think There are very many Names of the same combination um, Or you can find me On my website Which is essentially Transitionsinternational.com But the international Is I-N-T-L Not the full international so transitions intl.com um, and you can c- get in touch with me through the through my website as well where you can just hit the connect button and it will send me an email so those are the two places most common places to get in touch with thank you once more lalita it has been a pleasure talking to you and like i like i said you know good conversations actually live on forever <laughs> Indeed, and we can pick the threads anytime we want, right? That's the beauty about, as you said, percolating, processing, weaving, composting, and we can just, you know, just pick up from where we left off. And that's the beauty of, you don't need to know someone for a, a huge length of time. Good conversations just generate that energy. Yeah. Thank you once more, Lalita. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. What key messages do you take away from this episode? I learned one thing, to always take a moment, pause, and celebrate that achievement and pat myself on the back before moving on to the next thing. I recently put this to practice when a Penang media published an interview about me with the headline, How a Penang-born woman blazed a trail for female entrepreneurs. I remembered speaking to the reporter and telling him about my business, podcasts, community work, and more. But he added a headline to his article that made me do a double take. So I did take in that moment and patted myself on the back and said thank you for all the wins that enable me to do what I do every single day. We mustn't forget to pause and celebrate our achievements and milestones. It's too easy to move on to the next thing because we're busy. But precisely because we are busy, we need to do more of this for ourselves. And if this is the kind of story you love hearing, because just like me, you love learning from other women, do subscribe to the podcast. I'm absolutely excited at the lineup of women that I have for this season. And I'll see you next Friday with another brand new episode. Take care. Take care.